Hello everyone, welcome back to On The Ledger. This is your host Moul Said, and I'm back once again on your weekly rendezvous from Paris. But today is a different kind of rendezvous. At Ledger, as you probably know, we deeply care about Web3 security and the values of self-sovereignty. So much talent is working day in and day out on developing the best-in-class security solutions for your digital assets. And the truth is, we haven't really been talking about security that much on here. But that is about to change. From now on, every month, we'll take you with us behind the scenes at Ledger to discuss the most recent developments and dive into the latest hacks and scams to answer your most burning questions and provide you with the knowledge you need to safely navigate the space. And we've decided to call this monthly episode Never Been Hacked. Why Never Been Hacked? Simply because Ledger devices have never been hacked. But the thing is, and you probably know that, a ledger doesn't protect you from a mistake. And we hope that through our collective effort, most of you will be able to say that they've never been hacked or scammed. Accompanying me on this amazing journey are two of our very best security experts. And if you're an avid listener of this podcast, you probably already know them. I'm thrilled to welcome Charles Guimet, Ledger's Chief Technology Officer, and will be accompanied by Matt Johnson, Ledger Chief Information and Security Officer. Or should I say, Batman and Robin. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Um, I'm good. If I'm not Robin, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, pretty, pretty busy these days. Like securing the blockchain revolution is a full time job. I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, very, very well. Absolutely fantastic to be back and uh, good to see you and uh, everyone again and uh, looking forward to going on this journey with you all. Yeah, same here. I'm glad to have you both on the show. We have a lot to cover. But before we get started, maybe you could explain to our listeners what you do at Ledger. What does it mean to be a CTO or a CISO? Um, yes, so CTO stands for like Chief Technology Officer. So I'm basically in charge of the technology at Ledger. Um, that means I'm in charge of building the underlying technology which enables like custody and use for uh, digital assets. And as you know, the main challenge in this area is uh, security. So what we are doing day to day is very related to security and cryptography. And yeah, we are building the tools, allowing users, uh, retail users, but also financial institutions uh, to securely manage and use their uh, digital assets. And this, this, there was something like outstanding uh, about crypto. Uh, the, the very notion of immutability, like if ever you lose your uh, private key or someone, someone is able to make a transaction on your behalf, there is no way back. So that's why like, trans, um, the security is uh, very important uh, in this field. And this is, this is the mission of Ledger. Makes a lot of sense. So you're working on all the development of the products and the development of the infrastructures that enables individuals and corporations to secure their digital assets. What about you, Matt? What do you do at Ledger? Yeah, sure. So I'm the uh, the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, and I'm kind of the flip side um, to, to Charles. So my focus is very much on the security of our um, our internal systems and services and and data. Uh, whereas Charles and his team make all of the magic happen with uh, the products and the platforms that we need to make those products work and, and, and safe and secure. And, and Charles is very much focused on that external um, research and development and leading edge security research as well. Um, whereas my flip side to that is I've got the responsibility for looking out for the security of our community. So one of the things that I'm trying to spend a lot more time doing is is things like this this podcast is you know more awareness around the common scams or the common problems that uh, that the people may encounter or may face and how we can help protect them and thereby protect the ledger brand and keep those communities safe. And I think Mo, that there was actually something specific you had in mind when you you asked me along today. Yeah. So there's something specific I have in mind, and I think you already know the question, but you know that you're pretty famous on Twitter, um, and you keep following me from so many different accounts. So why do you have 5 to 10 Matt Johnson uh, Chief Information and Security Officer at Ledger accounts on Twitter right now? Well, Mo, I think the reason I keep following you is um, because you're really popular and you've got something that I want. Um, <laughs> so the, the the reality is that that they're not me. 
um, I'll, I'll go out on a bit of a limb and, and, and let you know that right now. Um, so if you ever see a, a Matt Johnson CISO at Ledger Twitter account, I do not have one of those. Um, and I don't use social media generally under my own uh, my own name. So if you see one of those, it's not me and it's a scam. So usually what people are, are using, they're, they're pretending to be me and they're wanting to correct, connect directly and offer support or advice if they've seen somebody put a, a tweet out saying, hey, I'm having a problem with this, and then all of a sudden, bang, you've got the, the CISO from Ledger saying, hey, let me help you out. People feel their guard comes down and feel like, hey, I've got somebody who wants to help. But normally what these accounts are doing is they're trying to help themselves to your 24 words. So this is some of the, the things that Charles has spoken about previously and, and I about the, the 24 words. These are the keys to your digital uh, crypto kingdom. So not your keys, not your coins. So always, always remember, don't ever share your 24 words ever. Um, and also things like Ledger, we, we will never um, direct message you. Um, we won't direct you to a form or a website that will ask you for your 24 words um, or ask you to download an application to install it, then ask you for your 24 words. Only ever download the updates for applications from known good URLs. So start at ledger.com and work your way through to the downloads point and actually download it from ledger.com, not from a link that somebody else has given you. Always check the addresses that, you, uh, that you're, you're going to. Never give out your 24 words to anyone. That's rule number one, two, three, four, and five, you know, regardless of how convincing they may seem. And always, always check the transactions and what you are signing because once you sign that, to Charles' point earlier, it's it's immutable. You can't reverse it. You can't phone up a bank and say, hey, can you undo that transaction? It's gone. So always make sure you do that. Oh, I'm disappointed. I thought Ledger support would be able to retrieve your funds uh, if they were lost. So obviously, this is a joke. This is the whole idea of the blockchain. The idea is that you are the sole owner of your keys. Um, and, uh, you know, as we were saying in the introduction, Ledger might protect you from a hack, but it doesn't protect you from a mistake. And let me let us dive a little bit more into, you know, the numbers. So every month we're going to deliver an update of the relentless work that your team uh, and your yourselves do as well um, to protect the Ledger community and the broader ecosystem. Um, and it, it all comes down to, you know, all of these things that you mentioned, right? So, for instance, this month, if we take a look at the numbers, we have 16 new phishing websites detected, 218 social media accounts and channels, three malicious Telegram channels, 24 malicious Google forms, five malicious Gmail um, addresses, three fake NFT collections, and it goes on and on and on. So just so we understand the potential attack vec vectors, and, and you touched on that a little bit, let's unpack some of these examples. The first one is the idea of a fake Ledger Live app. So, Charles, how are these made and what's the risk here? Um, what, is, what is important to understand as a user is the threat model. Uh, our products are designed such that even if your computer is completely backdoored, if there is malware within Ledger Live, even if you are using a fake Ledger Live, uh, you are safe. You are safe as long as you never share your 24 words, as uh, Matt uh, recalled before, or and and if you pay attention of uh, what kind of transaction uh, you you are signing, because when you sign something, you consent for something, and this something might be giving away all your wallet. So those are the two important things uh, you have to to keep in mind, and all the scam are always about uh, this very threat vector. Either they try to convince, the, to convince user to input their 24 words somewhere, or they are trying to uh, make them sign something which they, they didn't want. So this is all the time based on these this two uh, very uh, specific threat vector. So as long as you never share your 24 words and you pay attention to what you sign, you will be safe because this is what we are uh, building at Ledger. We are providing security as long as you uh, uh, pay attention to that. About your 24 words, there are only two locations. The first one is your backup. You write it down on, on, on the specific uh, piece of paper or um, a metal plate 
and you put it in a secure place and uh, you never uh, uh, need to use it again, apart if you want to recover a new device because your, your device is broken or uh, you, you bought a new one and you want to recover your wallet and at this specific time, you will input your words, but in the device, never mm -hmm. in your computer, in the device. So the, mm -hmm. the two locations where your 24 words are is uh, in, in the secure area at home, in, in a bank safe or something where the, your backup is, and the other location is within your device. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, I'd like to go back to, you know, Matt about that you know, idea of having different attack vectors and how these would affect your keys, right? So in, in, in the circumstance where someone has, you know, um, a chunk of their funds secured by the ledger and, and some other assets on their software wallet, and they get a Google form and they click on a link, um, which could be a malicious link, what do they actually risk here? Yeah, sure. So there, there are two parts to it. I mean, the, the Google form is just a, a, another extension. Generally, it will ask you for a name, an email address, and then you'll get to a point where it will say, um, oh, and to allow us to do this thing, you need to put in your 24 words, um, but that's okay because it's end-to-end -end hyper encrypted and, you know, whizzy jilly, you know, gosh stuff, and it's all safe and secure and you can trust us. Once again, it's about that scam to get you to to put those those twenty four words um, into it. And once that form sent off, obviously the uh, the attackers got um, got access to uh, to your funds and 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 your accounts. Mm -hmm. um, so then the, the the second part is you know what, about just clicking on a a link itself. Um, Charles, I mean, I think he he, he summed it up perfectly. You, know, you you're safe. Your keys are safe. But don't forget that the uh, clicking on a, a malicious link may not just be a scam to try and get your 24 words. You know, it could be trying to get you to download something else that backdoors your PC, to take you to a different version of a malicious website, um, to install ransomware. You know, so Ledger will keep your keys safe. Doesn't mean you should just go through clicking on anything and think it's all okay. You know, mm -hmm. you've still got to go back to that good security hygiene for yourself. You know, so never click on links that you don't know. Always validate and check the spellings and make sure that you're going to the right place. Um, you know, don't trust those things. If somebody says, hey, here's this, you know, just do this one, always go back to the company's original website and follow it through to the correct download link from there. Um, so that would be the, uh, the the pieces that I'd say. Mm -hmm. And in the case in the case of someone having um, some assets on a you know secured by the keys held on the Web two hardware, like we call it, or on the computer, if they do download a malicious link, their assets are at risk. Uh, is that Co is correct. that correct? And, and Co correct. Yeah. So, so Charles, you know, highlighted it, and I'll I'll do the same again. There are only two places that they ever go, and those two places are either onto your your backup, um, whichever form of backup that you're 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 using, either handwriting it down or putting it into a crypto steal or you know bootstrap or there's there's lots of different versions that you can use, and you store that one safely and securely somewhere. The second place is if you're doing a restore of your device, you only ever enter it into your Ledger Nano directly, mm -hmm. not type it into the keyboard because if it's, you know, if you're being asked to type it into the keyboard, that's not correct. You know, mm -hmm. if you take a photo of it, if you upload um, the photograph of it to the cloud, if you put it in a text file uh, or a Word document or, or anything like that, if you click on the link and somebody then compromises your, your laptop, your PC, your desktop, wherever you've got that stored, that malicious link could allow them access to where you've, um, unfortunately, insecurely stored your 24 words. Mm -hmm. So the idea about keeping it offline is you don't put it online. That, that that's a great point. And, and Charles, I think a lot of people find themselves in positions where they've been, you know, collecting NFTs or buying cryptocurrencies using their software wallets, and they just want to use the seed phrase, their 12-word seed phrase of the software wallet to input it in, in a ledger, and then maybe delete the software wallet completely off of the off of the computer. Is that a good idea? Yeah, very good question. So yeah, to your point, if you don't use a hardware wallet and you use a software wallet, whether it is like a Electrum uh, or MetaMask or like there are, uh, there are plenty of them, Trust Wallet, um, 
they are running on insecure hardware, like Web2 hardware, whether it is a, a desktop laptop or your mobile phone. And these uh, devices are not designed for security. That means that as an attacker, if you are able to uh, execute code on this machine, like this code will be able to drain your wallet, like simply either draining the, the wallet by executing transaction or uh, simply uh, pull out uh, the key. This is something very real and it happens uh, every day and I'm pretty sure it will happen at scale uh, in, in, in the future. So if ever you, your keys are uh, stored within a software wallet, there might be compromise. And as you, uh, to your point, which is, which is an in, in, interesting question, maybe in the past, an attacker get, got an access to uh, your 12 or 24 words and is just waiting you, uh, for, for you to, to uh, get more crypto, more NFT and drain your wallet later. So whenever you, uh, uh, you, 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 you get a ledger device, the best idea is to, uh, to, to create a new seed, gener generate a secret from this, from this seed, so a new account and transfer on chain your crypto and NFT from your software wallet to your hardware wallet. Mm -hmm. This is the best way to do that. Recovering is something possible. It's cheaper in terms of, of fees, but I wouldn't, re wouldn't recommend to do that. Yeah, it's it's not without risk. And um, I think it takes a lot of time, maybe, and a little bit of gas fees. But what you're saying is that the safest solution is just to make sure that you've generated those keys in an offline environment, which is in the ledger hardware. And verifying the 24 words on your trusted display um, would be like the 100% kind of safe solution there. This is Go like you, 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 you have left... Uh, you, the keys of, of your house on the table for years. Maybe some, some, someone took your, your key, like reproduce it and uh, put it back on the table. And then you, you say, okay, maybe now I would like to secure it and I will put it in a, in a, in a safe. You can do that, but maybe your key has, has been compromised before. This is something yeah. possible. Maybe someone took the print. That's a really good analogy. I'll, I'll, I'll start using that one from now on. Uh, so let me stay with you for a second there, Charles. Um, you obviously are working on the infrastructure, the products and, you know, developing and strengthening the, the ledger offering. But one of the things that you do with your team is actually working on research and working with different stakeholders in the ecosystem to actually strengthen the, 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 the security of the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and, and last week or a few weeks ago, actually, you were at the Black Hat conference um, with the dungeon. Uh, so first of all, could you tell us what is the Ledger Dungeon? Yeah, so first of all, you'll notice that the name is quite catchy. Yeah. Uh, the Dungeon is our internal uh, like product security team. Uh, I think it's been created uh, when I joined around five years ago. And basically, it's a mix of a blue team and a red team. Uh, if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, security, you know uh, what it means. Otherwise, I will, I will explain quickly. Uh, a blue team uh, means that they are participating in the design and security architecture of our different products. And this is what they do uh, from hardware to front end and back end. Uh, as soon as we are building uh, product and, and infrastructure, they are participating to the, to the architecture of that. And they are also doing some red teaming. So the first thing is blue teaming, but they are also doing some red teaming. And red teaming means they are continuously trying to like break our product. They try to find vulnerabilities on our product. And when they do so, and it happens, um, they work with the development teams in order to uh, fix this vulnerability and improve um, the security of our product. They, it's a small team. They, I think they are around like 12 and uh, with a wide um, area of expertise from hardware security, software security, cryptography, of course. And, uh, and, and today also uh, they are moving into uh, getting more uh, impact on blockchain security, like smart contract and so on. Uh, and so what they are doing day to day is that, like raising the bar for security uh, for our product. But also, in order to always stay ahead of the state of the art, they are spending some time doing uh, like security research, cryptography research in general, not only a vulnerability research on our product, but just improving the security of the ecosystem overall. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you mentioned, yes, they presented at Black Hat uh, during the summer, it was in, it was in August. And uh, for, for those who are not familiar with Black Hat, this is... I think the most prestigious 
um, uh, security conference in the world. Uh, it's been created 25 years ago, uh, four years after DEF CON. DEF CON was really more the black side of Black Hat at this time. And it happens just before DEF CON in, uh, in Vegas. Like both uh, are opening in Vegas. And the initial focus of the conference was to uh, put the engineers and the security researchers in the same room and also to, uh, to in order to improve uh, the security overall, but also to avoid full disclosure. Because 20, 25 years ago, what was happening uh, when, you when you found a, a vulnerability, you just published it and all the users were at risk and a security company or a software company were really pissed off because they couldn't do anything. So that's what this is when like uh, this uh, this um, uh, security conference and uh, and the, the black hat slash white hat uh, paradigm started, and also uh, companies started to incentivize security researchers to give uh, a vulnerability beforehand and so on. Today, it's a very big conference, like several thousand of attendees, very large room, this is Vegas, um, and, uh, and a lot of uh, presentation up to, I think, 10 tracks in parallel. So if you want to attend to every single uh, uh, conference, you simply can't. And it's, it's a quite surprising event because you can find like part of the best security researcher in the world, along with like intelligence agencies, they are around, uh, sometimes hidden, sometimes not. And also uh, you have some uh, like security companies uh, selling some, sometimes some snake oil. Uh, it's a little bit hard because all, all this uh, ecosystem is mixed in the same area for, for a, couple of, uh, a, a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this year, uh, the dungeon pre uh, like uh, presented uh, four papers, submitted, like submitted uh, two papers uh, for, for this edition and both papers have been accepted. Uh, I think this is the fourth year in a row that Ledger has uh, paper accepted uh, to uh, this uh, this conference, which is uh, which is quite an achievement. And uh, this time we had like two papers. The first one was um, uh, presented by Karim and the team, and it was a side channel attack on ESP32 circuit. Um, uh, take take a breath. I will explain a little bit. Uh, ESP32 <laughs> is a widely used um, circuit. Uh, like you can find this kind this kind of circuit everywhere in your toaster, in your uh, remote control, in your like. It's very very widely used, uh, and it's also used in one hardware wallet in uh, in the ecosystem. I think it's Jad One, and uh, this circuit has been. So um, they use the same the same thing as a toaster. That's what you're saying here. Yeah, it's, uh, general purpose uh, microelectronic is uh, is like this. There, there are there are various uh, use cases for, uh, for for a circuit, but yes, okay. uh, but you can you can find this uh, circuit also in automotive, for instance, which is uh, yeah. Uh, and so uh, um, a few years ago, I think uh, two years ago, there was a team called like Unlimited Result, uh, which. Uh, found a vulnerability on the circuit, uh, glitching it, like uh, they changed the power supply of the circuit at very precise timing, and it allows to get access to a very specific um, uh, part of the circuit, the bootloader, and uh, the, the ESP team was a little bit pissed off, but they finally fixed this vulnerability, and now it's not possible to uh, extract the bootloader anymore, but uh, Karim had a look to the fix, he, um, he understood that the fix is okay, but he found another channel, uh, another threat, uh, threat vector, which is side channel attack. And what he did is like recording uh, the power consumption of the circuit uh, during its operation and found some correlation between this power consumption and the encryption key of the firmware. And he, doing this, he was able to e extract the bootloader again. So that, that was a very fun um, uh, attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's not fixed yet. So if you use ESP32, uh, don't count on the confidentiality of your firmware because it's possible to extract it quite easily. So that was the first paper, a uh, very interesting one. And, uh, there, there was a lot of uh, interest at Black Hat uh, uh, about this, uh, this presentation. Now, let, let's unpack the first one first, because if you go into the second one before unpacking the first one, I'm going to yes. I'm gonna like forget sure. all of my questions. So first of all, the question I had before unpacking the first one is, you said that if we actually publish this research publicly, 
some attackers might leverage on you know this information to actually steal people's assets. How do you protect people from that? Um, do you actually fix these uh, vulnerabilities before going to the conference? Do you reach out to the teams that are working on these products? How does that? What's the process like? This is a, this is something I was mentioning uh, briefly uh, at the beginning of Black Hat. There was no responsible disclosure. That was that was directly uh, publishing widely. Um, but now there, there was this notion of uh, coordinated responsible uh, vulnerability, uh, responsible disclosure for vulnerability, and uh, this process. Um, is like you are a researcher, you find a vulnerability. The first thing you do is contacting the vendor, explaining uh, him the, the vulnerability in question, and sometimes working with the vendor in order to help uh, him to fix uh, this, uh, this vulnerability. And then it depends on the vendor. Sometimes they, they just don't care about your finding, or sometimes they um, they want to sue you. It, happen, it still happens. In the past, it was happening a lot. Not now, it's uh, more rare, but still, uh, sometimes it happens. And most often, when you find a vulnerability, you uh, agree on timeline where you let the vendor enough time to fix the vulnerability. And then at the end of this period, uh, you, you, you agree that you can publish uh, your, your paper and your, and your research. This is the, this is the, the usual way to uh, deal with uh, vulnerabilities. Okay. With software, it's often very easy uh, because software is easy to update and so on. With hardware, uh, it might be a little bit more tricky. So either you agree on a very long timeline, you say, okay, for the next revision of your hardware, uh, I, I, I let you the time uh, to do a, a new revision. It can take up to 18 months uh, if it's only a small fix. Um, and, uh, and, you, you, and you present your, your research after the 18 months. Or you can say, okay, we, uh, we did the, the analysis and we think it does not put users too much, too much at risk. So you publish the vulnerability and the vendor choose to either uh, uh, fix uh, the vulnerability or not. Because... ESP32 is not a secure circuit, so the, the, the claims can, can be different. Like, uh, maybe they don't want to protect uh, in, uh, from this kind of attack for, by, uh, by any mean. This is, this is not the mission of the circuit. And probably this is, this is what the, the, the ESP32 uh, company, Microchip, um, uh, chose to, to do. Okay, that's great to know. So whenever we actually go to that conference, we make sure that the company or the organization that is um, linked to that vulnerability can have the time to actually patch it before. So coming back to that first paper, you were talking about side channel attacks. And we have a pretty cool episode from Enter the Dungeon explaining yeah. what side channel attacks are. But could you give us like a quick overview of what side channel attacks are and what, what are the risks, risks associated with it? And then uh, maybe dive a little bit more to unpack um, what we actually did in a, in a language that non-technical people would understand, uh, such as myself. <laughs> yeah. So like, cryptography is math. And with math, you can prove the security of your protocol. And this is something quite robust. Like There is a big science behind this. And we can have uh, pretty big guarantees on the security of your, the protocol you, 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 are, uh, you, you are designing. This is cryptography on paper. Now you have to implement cryptography and cryptography will be implemented on, uh, on your laptop, on your uh, mobile phone, on your uh, like specific circuit, on some hardware. And when this implementation takes place, you're not in the ID world, you are in the real world. And in the real world, there, there are side channels. And these side channels means like computing something have consequences. For instance, you need some time to compute uh, something. Like, uh, let's take a, a, a simple example. You input your, your, your password and imagine the algorithm verifying if your uh, password is correct. Like, scan each single letter and if ever the letter is, is not correct, it's, it says no. So that means that the time for verifying your password depends on like um, uh, if your first letter is, is correct or not, if the second letter is correct or not. So this is a side channel, like the time necessary for uh, mm -hmm. the device to verify if your password is good or not. 
okay. is a side channel. So this is a, a, a quite simple example, and it works very well if it's implemented like this. Of course, obviously, uh, now passwords verification are not implemented like that, but if you implement it, implement it like this, uh, this is this is a big issue. So it's a short window of time in which someone can actually corrupt that whole process and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, take control of, of the machine. Mm, the, the, the example was a little bit more different. Like, yeah. uh, there, there was, like, imagine your password is a, is alphanumeric, uh, is a on, on, only digits, like it's a pin code. Mm -hmm. and ima imagine that the algorithm verifying your pin code, like, verify the first digit, and if it's, co if it's not correct, he says no. If, it, if it's correct, he will verify uh, the second digit. If it's not correct, he will say no. So that means that the time necessary to verify your PIN code depends on if the first digit is correct, if the second digit is correct. So as an attacker, what you can do is input one PIN, measure the time. And if the time is like uh, the time for verifying one digit, that means that the first digit is, is not correct. And oh, then, okay. So Got time it. is a side channel. Time is okay. a side channel. It's a hint. Yeah, it's a hint, but it's very, very, very good hint. Like, uh, okay. All right. I got it. Uh, so what about that second paper? What was it all about? Yeah, so the, the second paper is uh, was about like um, uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, firmware security. Like inside your uh, laptop, you you have a Wi-Fi uh, chipset, which allows again this is a circuit uh, uh, which implements Wi-Fi, and but it's an independent circuit which is connected to your motherboard and so on, and it it, it allows you to connect uh, your uh, laptop to, uh, to to your Wi-Fi. And this chipset is independent, and there is some firmware running uh, uh, in this uh, in this chipset. And um, like th this was someone in the in the dungeon, and he had some difficulty uh, with like doing something very precise with his uh, with his uh, Wi-Fi card, and he started to add the challenges with that. So he started to reverse engineer. Uh, how the firmware was working and finally he understood how it works and he was able to bypass the firmware verification. So that means that the code running in this chipset must be legitimate, otherwise you can, you can put malware and so on and no one can, uh, can, can be aware of that because it's far away from the operating system. The operating system has no clue what's going on in this firmware. So that's why there was this uh, like, uh, firmware verification in order to be sure that the code running in this Wi-Fi card is legitimate, like uh, produced by Intel. Uh, and what, what the team uh, uh, understood is that it's possible to bypass this firmware verification, meaning they could implement whatever firmware they want and spy your communication, for instance. Whenever you can inject some code in the chipset, it's finished, and and the operating system cannot know, uh, cannot be aware of this, and uh, uh, your uh, antivirus cannot be aware of, of that uh, neither. This is like completely undetectable, and so on. So that was uh, quite uh, quite huge, and this uh, vulnerability has been like reported to uh, Intel security, and they, I think they spent like six months, maybe eight months. To fix the to fix the vulnerability, and now uh, your uh, your chipset, your your Wi-Fi chipset is more secure uh, because of uh, of the work of the dungeon. I was just saying, Mo, you've got to be careful because down in the dungeon, it's like a room full of Batman. Yeah, that's that's Batman and Robin and James Bond, all of all of the wonderful protectors. Um, but you know, we we usually like you know at, at the show we like. And in a more general sense, at Ledger, we like decentralizing um, that, you know, which is previously top down. And we actually asked the community what they wanted to ask you guys in terms of, you know, their questions, their worries, the things that they're not pretty sure about. So I have a couple of questions here um, from the community. First one is for you, Matt. Is it actually safe to buy Ledger from a reseller? Is it safe to buy Ledger from a reseller? Yes, it is, as long as it's one of our legitimate resellers. So please check on the website and you've got the list of the uh, the, the resellers there so you can know the, the right one. But the other thing to know is that um, the Ledger products themselves will do a, a verification check. So as long as you've downloaded your Ledger live application from uh, the, the, the appropriate site, um, ledger.com, 
and uh, done the install there. When you go through the initialization process, it will actually do a check and make sure that the uh, device itself is legitimate and uh, it is correct. Now, the one thing that I will also stress here is that uh, another variation on a scam that we've seen is people preceding or pre-initializing a device mm-hmm. and then returning them and then them being resold, so re-shrink wrapped or anything. So if you uh, ever get a device um, that's been already initialized, please enter uh, incorrect pin code um, three times, um, brick the device, factory reset it, and then you can actually go through and, and do it again. Personally, I would say just return it and get a, uh, a, a new one. Uh, or also if you see a scratch card, so sometimes you might see a card that's got um, uh, the silver uh, on it that you scratch off mm-hmm. with your 24 words. Once again, it's somebody that's giving you the 24 words. The 24 words aren't being um derived from the device itself on initialization. So that's another key uh, key point um, to, 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 to be aware of. That's, that's pretty interesting what you're saying here. So a preceded device means that the device comes and is already, um, you know, initialized. And you get like some sort of a card that says, here is your 24-word seed phrase. If this is the first ledger you buy, you might think that this is a normal thing. Like the password comes with the device, completely yep. normal. You scratch it. You, um, you know, initialize the device that's already been initialized. So you initialize it again with that same seed phrase and you, you know, transfer your Bitcoins, Ethereum or whatever from the exchange. The hacker actually has access to that same exact account and transfers your assets out. This or is- the attacker may wait, wait for a year. Uh, or two years. So it goes back to that very good example that Charles gave earlier about leaving your key there and transferring from a, uh, a, a software wallet to the hardware wallet. You know, you wouldn't do that. You reinitialize, get your new seeds and then transfer it across. That's really good to know because this is really a question that we get a lot on, on Twitter and, and different social channels. And another question that we do get a lot, and, and it's one I'm pretty curious about, Charles, could a gasless signature empty your wallet? Could a gasless signature be malicious? And maybe explain the difference between a gas, um, you know, a signature with gas and a signature without. So an on, off-chain and on-chain um, signature. Yeah, it's a, it's a very precise one, but uh, it's it's an important one, definitely. Um, so when you sign something with your device, what you are doing is digital signature. We are using your private key to compute this digital signature. Most of the time, this is um, for transacting on chain. So that means that in what you are signing, you say something like, okay, I transact this specific amount of Bitcoin uh, to this specific uh, address with um, that amount of fees. So this is the typical thing you sign uh, when, when, you, when you do a transaction with your uh, wallet. But sometimes you sign a message which is not uh, used to be broadcast, broadcasted on-chain. This is what we, what we call like a gasless signature or of off-chain transaction. But at the end, a signature is a signature. Whenever you sign a document uh, on paper, you agree to something. Sometimes it's very straightforward to understand. Like I consent to send this amount of bit of Bitcoin to this specific address with the following fees on chain transaction. Sometimes it's less straightforward and more difficult to understand. But long story short, yes, a gasless signature can drain your wallet. I have a simple example in mind. You can sign a message saying, "I agree to sell my NFT." All my NFT collection, including this very uh, uh, expensive board ape for 0.0.1 ETH on OpenSea. You can sign this message, like it's an off-chain message, but if an attacker gets this message, he can sign another message saying, I'm okay to buy uh, this offer of NFT collection for 0.0.1 ETH. And the way OpenSea is working is the following. You take the two off-chain, off-chain signature, you, uh, you pack them into a specific payload, and then you do an on-chain transaction with uh, fees this time, where uh, you, you will provide this two off-chain uh, signature. And doing this, as an attacker, you just did something very legitimate, like you using the, tr- the smart contract, 
and something legitimate from the smart contract perspective, meaning buying all the NFT collection of uh, the user for 0. 0. Uh, 0.01 ETH. This, this is, is crazy. Completely uh, gasless off chain, and this is uh, this is possible. I was just saying how crazy this is because most of you know most of the common knowledge around that, and I I I you know I can say that I was believing that a gasless transaction wouldn't have as much risk as a set approval for all or send ETH, all of these like smart contract function uh, transactions, which are, you know, on-chain transactions. Um, I'm, I actually thought that these were the main uh, risk, I would say, vectors, but it seems like even a gasless transaction, if combined with another one, would actually be able to, um, you know, drain your wallet, um, even on like well-known marketplaces, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is how, this is not a, like a dummy example. This is how OpenSea works. Like OpenSea work like this. Uh, and it's designed like, like this in order to uh, to minimize fee because as fees are important on uh, on Ethereum, um, because another way to do that like is, is the following. As soon as you want to, uh, to do something with your NFT, like doing a listing, doing an offer, you can do like on-chain transaction. But if you do that, it will be very costly for users. So in order to avoid this, what OpenSea did is like an off-chain mechanism where you just sign a message, everything is yeah. off-chain, but the, the settlement, only the settlement is on-chain. Yeah, but but you have to do set approval for all once. So you pay gas once, and if you've done that set approval for all, it's then a gas is trans- not, not, not even true. true. Yeah, you, wow. can, you can do a, like a wrapper smart contract, which will do, which will execute everything on one uh, on one execution. It's, wow. it's more complex to be implemented, but I have, I've already this in this in in the wild so i mean this leaves us with a really great hook i think next month we should do an episode about smart contract functions and the different risks associated with signatures yeah i think that would be i would i would benefit from that a lot gentlemen i learned a lot from you thank you for taking the time and i'm looking forward to next month yeah cool so do i thank you very much thanks very much mo it's great to be here and good chatting see you soon that's it Truly the kind of conversation that we need in the space. We'll be back next month with our second edition of Never Been Hacked. But in the meantime, don't hesitate to ask us your questions on Twitter. Check out our Ledger Academy for more security-focused content. And please, please, please never share your 24 words and look at what you're saying. Till next time, stay safe. Au revoir. This content is provided for informational purposes only and is the sole expression of our opinion and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Do your own research. Any loss or profit is your sole responsibility. Stay safe.